I'm Drew Stevenson. This is for my administrative law class. Here we're going to be talking about a 2024 case from the U.S. Supreme Court, Ohio versus the Environmental Protection Agency. This case is about judicial review of agency actions and specifically the standard of review that we call arbitrary and capricious. And in that context, it's about that level of review when circumstances changed rather substantially after the agency proposed its initial rule. So having said that, let's dive in. So our big takeaway in Ohio versus EPA is that when an agency proposes a regulation, and here we're talking about an air pollution rule, it's arbitrary and capricious for the agency not to explain or fully why the rule would still work or be effective even when circumstances have changed significantly. In other words, they must respond to valid objections about things like this when they are raised. Now, just a, a little bit of factual background without going too far into the area uh, and the details of air pollution. We have a number of air pollution regulations, and in 2015, the EPA decided to ratchet up or adopt a stricter air pollution rule for states, specifically about ozone, um, uh, that and as air pollution that could migrate from one state to states downwind. One of the problems with air pollution is that it doesn't stay in one place. Um, there are air currents that move across the country. So you could have one state that has power plants and factories that produce a lot of pollution, and all the pollution ends up over an, another state, a lot of times a neighboring state, but it could even be a few states away that are downwind. So the EPA tries to manage this problem. And in 2015, they adopted a stricter rule for uh, basically ozone that goes across state lines. And a lot of states basically ignored it because they didn't want to comply with this stricter rule. So in 2023, the EPA adopted what turned out to be a really unpopular aggregate plan for 23 of the states, that's almost half the country, to address the problem of interstate pollution. But 12 of those 23 states did not want to follow this aggregate plan, so they ran into court and obtained stays saying that they did not have to follow it. So the EPA then insisted on sticking with its original plan for the remaining 11 states, even though the plan was based on scientific and mathematical projections about emissions and air quality impacts for the original 23 combined. And at least according to the court, the EPA did not explain enough why its plan would still work when, um, especially in light of the fact that some parties had raised this very concern, what happens if states don't, um, some of the 23 states don't participate. Um, they had raised that during the public comment period on the rule. And instead, the EPA simply announced that its plan was severable. And that severable is a legal term for if you cut off part of something, the rest of it still works. And so their position was, even if a state dropped out, the original plan would just continue to apply unchanged to the remaining jurisdictions. And the agency didn't really redo the scientific calculations to account for fewer states participating. So let's get to the holding of the case. Uh, the basic or bottom line is that an agency action is arbitrary or capricious if it is not reasonable and reasonably explained. Now, this was a five to four decision. Um, mostly along party lines, except one of the person from the conservative bloc, as we'll see, uh, sided with the, um, the liberals in dissenting. Now, back to the explanation. The explanation needs to include, among other things, that the agency has offered a satisfactory explanation for its action, including a rational connection between the facts found and the choice made. Now, I have a little procedural note that actually kind of matters for this case. The case came to the Supreme Court through its what we call its shadow docket. In other words, it was a petition for a pretrial emergency stay. 
And that means that the case can still go to trial and the EPA might win, as the dissent believes will happen. Um, But the majority thought the EPA was unlikely to prevail on the merits due to its holding. Now, let's talk about Justice Barrett's dissent, which is going to give us a springboard to talk about sort of a bigger issue in administrative law that we see in this case. Justice Barrett dissented, joined by Kagan, Sotomayor, and Jackson. She said that the majority actually blocked enforcement of the EPA's plan, quote, based on an underdeveloped theory that is unlikely to succeed on the merits. And I just want to explain that for a second. The Her idea is that Um, This problem that the court identifies of, well, half the states almost uh, or more of the uh, 23 that were supposed to be part of this aggregate plan are not going to participate now. And so that seems to us to create a problem that you should have thought about or explained. But it's sort of an argument from uh, guess or guesswork. The, The people on the U.S. Supreme Court aren't scientists. They don't know for sure that the plan doesn't still work for the remaining 11 states um, or that it's not kind of a good enough plan, even without half the states participating. And so it's sort of just a, a guess that, well, it sounds like circumstances have changed a lot that the EPA should have to redo their calculations, even though they don't have a firm scientific Um, basis factually for knowing that the plan won't work. Um, Also, concerns about states dropping out were indeed still hypothetical during the public comment period. In other words, the majority opinion in this case puts a lot of emphasis on the fact that one or more commenters Um, asked, like, what happens to this aggregate plan if some states don't participate or get out of it because of stays, they get a stay in a court. And, but at that point, the rule hadn't gone into effect. And so these were hypothetical concerns uh, being raised during the comment period. And the, the majority in this case kind of conflates that or collapses the distinction between the the public comment period and when the rule went into effect. Um, Also, Justice Barrett thought that the agency had, in fact, provided um, an adequate explanation for the plan to survive. The EPA would have promulgated the same plan, she says, even if fewer states were covered. And then she gets to the practical effects of the uh, majority's opinion. So uh, in theory or on paper, uh, there's some logic to what the majority opinion says. But in practice, this means that there's large swaths of upwind states that are free to keep polluting and contributing significantly to their downward neighbor's ozone problems for the next several years. In other words, there's a real problem here that the EPA was really trying to fix and manage. And what the Supreme Court did is they they thwarted that. So they maybe have fixed the EPA's procedural issue um, uh, and the problem that maybe they should have redone their calculations but they've left in place the real world problem that the EPA was trying to address. And then there's this thing in the case that comes up in both the majority opinion and the dissent about the term called the knee of the curve. And I wanna take a few minutes to discuss this uh, for my administrative law students. The majority opinion mentions this phrase, the knee of the curve repeatedly, and Barrett's dissent emphasizes that this was not in any of the public comments about the rules, so the EPA could not have responded to the problems with the knee of the curve. Um, On the other hand, the EPA had talked about it some in their own record of the rule. But here's a great quote from uh, Justice Barrett's dissent. Given the importance to the court's theory of how the knee of the curve um, might change with different states, one might expect to find some mention of that idea in applicants' briefs, and one would be wrong. So what is the knee of the curve? Well, this is the idea that um, it's an idea about sort of the sweet spot or the optimal level to set regulations. In some environmental cases from the 1980s and 1990s, 
industries even tried to force the EPA to adopt a knee of the curve rule for reasonable pollution controls. Um, the EPA, as, as a practice, often did this in, the, in its early years, in the 1970s and 1980s, where what happens with things like uh, certain types of safety measures or pollution controls, uh, emission reduction, let's say at your factories, is that you, um, you, you get sort of a, a return on your investment. You spend a little bit of money, let's say $100, and you can reduce your emissions a certain amount. You spend twice that, and maybe you reduce your emissions twice that amount or a little bit more. And you can keep going, but at some point to get one more increment of pollution reduction, it suddenly becomes much, much more expensive. So the, the costs suddenly spiral upwards or shoot upwards. And that could be because you have to buy, replace all of your factory equipment with something much more expensive, or you have to hire a lot more workers um, and have more shifts at your plant or redo your your business processes or something like that. So the EPA often actually did try to set the regulation at the knee of the curve in terms of the cost of implementation. Um, and when they didn't, sometimes the industry tried to force them to. This is an old um, 1989 case from the Fifth Circuit that gives a handy little graph sort of showing that. And I want you to look at this for a second because it illustrates this. Um, whether the EPA should require pollution control expenditures beyond the point at which costs escalate rapidly in relation to the benefit. So as you can see on this graph, if um, we spend a little bit of money, we remove a certain percentage of the pollution and you spend a little more, you, get, you, re you reduce pollution more, but there's a point at which the costs really go up to get any more pollution reduction. And so we call that point where it bends the knee of the curve. And this comes up in a lot of areas of administrative law when regulators are trying to find the perfect rule or the, the optimal place or most reasonable place to set a regulation. Depending on what you studied as an undergraduate, you may have heard this referred instead uh, to instead as hockey stick curves. Some areas, academic disciplines call it that. And it's a graph pattern showing either flat or incremental increase followed by a sudden rapid increase. And this could be in costs or in profits um, or production or something like that. Here's an example um, from a, a pretty recently from a magazine called The Hustle about the cost of snow removal for a, municipal, a large municipality, New York City in particular. Um, and so I, I want you to notice here the inches of snow is on one line of the graph and the total cost of removing it is the other. And so when we're talking about how much does it cost to remove a certain amount of snow, like two feet, well... It, it, starting out, if you have to buy snow plows for your city at all, that's a big initial cash outlay. But once you have a fleet of snow plows, your, your ongoing costs per inch of snow actually start to go down because you already have the plows. But at some point, the cost per inch of snowfall start going up again. And I want you to notice it's right after 40 inches. And if you've ever seen a big snow plow truck and with the plow blade in front of it, I want you to think about how high that is. And basically, if the snow gets so deep that it's over the top of the plow, then it spills over when you're plowing. And so you plow and there's still all this snow in the road. So you either need to buy much bigger plows, which is a lot more expensive, or you have to have a second snowplow follow the first one to clean up all that um, overspill from that. And so as you can see, when we get up to 60 inches of snow, which is five feet of snow, it becomes much more expensive. Now that's a rare snowstorm, even in New York City, that might only happen every few years, but New York might get a, um, a 40 inch snowfall uh, once or twice a winter, it, it's possible. So it's, um, it just depends, but this is a nice graph for illustrating that the costs for government expenditures or solving problems or even for complying, uh, for a regulated industry to comply are not always linear. They may 
have diminishing marginal costs over time. And then at some point, the direction of the curve reverses. And that concludes our lecture about Ohio versus EPA, arbitrary and capricious, and the knee of the curve. <laughs>